Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so let's uh, get this latest in our, our seminar series for the, the Dara e seminars underway. Uh, welcome back to all the old faces uh, who are regularly joining and welcome to some of the new ones. Um, so today it's a great pleasure uh, to have along uh, Carla Sharp uh, to, uh, to give our e-seminar today. Uh, so Carla is uh, the DARA lead uh, from the South African perspective. Remember that DARA is a joint you know, UK South African project. Um, so you know, I lead it from the UK side, uh, but uh, Carla uh, is the lead on the South African side. So uh, Carla works for the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. Uh, so that's the new organization in South Africa that you know, basically merged the sort of SKA effort in South Africa. Um, obviously that's driving the whole radio astronomy effort across the African continent uh, and also merged in with, uh, with the uh, Artebistoc Radio Astronomy Observatory, uh, which is where a lot of the DARA training takes place uh, for the um, for the basic training program as well, the practical work. And so many of you will be familiar with that as well. So, um, excuse me. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, I'll just hand over to uh, Carla to, to get underway. So she's gonna talk about, uh, so she's in charge of the Africa program, which is, you know, basically the AVN and everything to do with uh, radio astronomy across the continent. Uh, but also very much, as you'll see, linked to the effort in uh, in linking things up with the, the burgeoning space industry as well. Uh, so we look forward to hearing what she has to say. As usual, if you have questions that come to mind as you go along, you can put them in the Q&A window. Um, we will take questions at the end when I will attempt to unmute you and you can ask your question then. But obviously, um, we'll, we'll wait to the end for the questions. Okay, so over to Carla. Thank you, Marvin. I'm just going to open up my presentation. Okay, so I hope you can all see that okay. Um, I like to talk about a sustainable future on and off Earth because a lot of the work we do in space sciences um, and the development of space technologies has spin out effects um, for use on Earth and a lot of what we develop on Earth for even textile manufacturing finds its uses in space and I think it's really important to integrate what's happening for the space industry and the space sciences and integrate those with what's going on on the ground to develop a more sustainable uh, future. I mentioned technology here as a tool because I'm an economist and economics, which I'll bring up later, <laughs> tends to chase technology for the sake of technology. And the development of technology is a tool that we use um, towards growth and towards sustainability and innovation, but it's not an end in itself and it can be a failing of governments to chase it as an end in itself. So a little about me, um, I consider myself a space cadet. I did look up the official meaning of this. It's a trainee astronaut, so I am not an astronaut. And the informal definition is a person regarded as being out of touch with reality. So that's a decision you can make after my presentation. But my personal mission is to positively impact lives in Africa using space technology. And my life goal is actually to be in space one day and see Earth from space, not a picture, but with my own eyes. So people always ask what I do and because it's space, it sounds exciting. My family always introduces me as an astronaut and I do believe my friends think that I'm one of the men in black I just have a normal business job. I know my colleagues think I do a lot of coffee, which I do, but an important part of my job is stakeholder management. So I do do a lot of talking. I know my boss thinks I just dream about space all day. I think I'm a snappy businesswoman, but as you can see in the last picture, I'm just busy like everyone else. So why space? Um, 
we interact with space in two ways. Uh, we look at the at space from the Earth, and this would be radio astronomy, like our Meerkat telescope, the SKA, uh, the various different types of astronomy, whether it's optical or the various different frequencies. And we do this for the purposes of research, uh, study, and understanding. And then we have the space industry, and this looks at Earth from space. This is using satellites. And as you can see in the images below, there's an on the ground view during a cyclone. This was uh, the terrible cyclone um, recently in Mozambique. And then you can look at the satellite image, which shows you exactly where the roads, bridges are, where the waterways, uh, where the water has overwhelmed areas. And this allows for relief um, and repair. Uh, obviously, space science has many applications, uh, space technology has many applications from agriculture, um, defense. Um, in Ghana, for example, it is extremely useful to detect illegal gold mining, which is an enormous challenge for, for Ghana. So um, in the question why space, uh, we can look at the sustainable development goals. All 17 of them can be addressed in one way or another, uh, not completely, but by space technology offering uh, parts of the solution to each of these sustainable uh, goals. And this is why I think it's important not just to focus on a space science um, or economic development or innovation without including space. It's a, it's a real driver to solving the problems we face in Africa. So just a quick economics lesson for those of you who are not economists. Um, we say that technology drives economic growth. Um, growth and trade create this, uh, they say, a reinforcing dynamic, almost like a, a cycle, which generates the wealth effect. And then this, of course, uh, generates uh, economic growth. Um, the problem is, statistically, we can show that technology growth drives economic growth in developed nations. But in developing nations, this relationship is assumed. We don't have enough data to actually prove it. So I'm doing my PhD in economics and I'm trying to show that technology and space science and technology are actually drivers of growth in developing countries, um, but it's very difficult. So I'm trying to show um, things slightly differently and assume that there is a level of economic standing and technology development in a country and beneath this level, uh, technology will not drive economic growth. And so my studies are trying to work out what that level is of an economy um, below which technology doesn't drive growth. So we have the multiplier effect, and this is where, say we use uh, space industry is growing and developing, and it's driving economic growth, and this ultimately the effects multiply. So um, a rand spent or a dollar spent on uh, uh, space technology will actually end up growing the economy, say, by $3. And we work on this to justify the investment. And then space sciences. I know in Africa and other developing nations, we have the challenge of people who don't have access to basic resources such as water, clean water, food, etc. And then why do we spend on, on science? But the spending on science has had many great impacts across the many scientific areas uh, to our everyday life. And some of those for radio astronomy, for example, are the advent of Wi-Fi, time referencing for GPS systems. Uh, we all rely on GPS, whether we like it or not. Um, CAT scans and various other um, data, te uh, data techniques and medical devices. So. Um, it's really important to keep growth, development, and innovation in, uh, in the sciences. So in my model, I, um, as I mentioned before, we take an economy and we look at the level of technology development, its level of being qualified as an economy, as knowledge economy, the macroeconomic stability, and growth potential. These are standardized uh, 
uh, indicators that we look at in economics and I'm actually developing new ones that I feel are more relevant to Africa um, but that's still underway I'll share that with you if you're interested when I'm done and then I look at the amount and type of investment so uh, the amount is just the level of investment in currency and the type is whether it's an investment into infrastructure um, or uh, instrumentation, etc. So, for example, the SKA in South Africa, we spent money on roads, uh, power lines, substations. We've also built the actual instruments, etc. So, um, it's important to look at the type of investment, and then you can justify your social and economic benefit out of the project. So for those of you who don't know the Square Kilometre Array project very well, it's an, now an international governmental organization. It was established by 12 countries around the world. And the plan is to build the world's biggest radio telescope. Uh, both South Africa and Australia bid for this. And ultimately, uh, the hosting was awarded to both, uh, with a mid-frequency instrument being built in South Africa and a low-frequency instrument being built in Australia. The Meerkat telescope was South Africa's precursor instrument or our contribution in terms of our bid, and that was uh, completed in 2018. It's a 64 dish radio telescope, and we're very proud of it. It's doing really good science, and it's been operational now for two years next month. This was the first image we released with the Meerkat telescope. I'm sure most of you have seen this. Um, the black hole at the center of our galaxy can be seen as the bright area in the middle. And to the left of it, a star nursery where stars are formed and some supernova remnants to the left of that, which I like to call a star graveyard. In 2019, we released this image. Um, these are giant galactic bubbles um, going above and below the black hole in the center of our galaxy, as you saw in the previous image. I have to be honest, I don't fully understand the importance of galactic bubbles, but <laughs> I know the scientists were really excited. So what's important of our radio telescopes, in particular Meerkat and the SKA, is the data pipeline. So these telescopes um, use an enormous amount of data and the SKA ultimately, the numbers are boggling. And so one of the challenges we have is figuring out how to transport data in volumes like this, how to store it, how to analyze it. And um, we have big teams allocated to trying to solve these problems, both in South Africa and abroad for the SKA. Uh, Meerkat itself uh, uses uh, a line that's 100 gigabits per second. And the data rate coming off the telescope at any time is the equivalent to watching about five and a half thousand digital TV channels at the same time. So Meerkat, when it's processing inside, it will uh, phase up the data for its uh, correlation. And this means inside uh, the supercomputer behind Meerkat, the data rates can increase to as much as 15 terabits per second. And then um, that is reduced and leaves the telescope into the pipeline at about two. Um, it's also a unique instrument in that it's a multicast instrument. So it can actually perform multiple science missions at the same time. Um, I, I was asked uh, the other day to do a radio interview about whether or not there are aliens, which <laughs> was a challenging interview. But uh, why I bring this up is we host a number of guest instruments and we have a partnership with Break, Breakthrough Listen, uh, which is affiliated to SETI. And so they have computing at the back of our telescope and they sift through all our data looking for technical signatures, um, hopefully coming from other sources. But uh, the open ar architecture of Meerkat allows for these collaborations to run simultaneously. So back again to the economics. How do we derive economic be benefits? So there, there is direct impact, direct spending in the area. We decrease the skills gap. This is by um, educational programs and training, bursary programs, et cetera. And then infrastructure-led growth. As I say, we built 80 kilometers of road, 110 kilometers of power lines, et cetera. And the, this is not just for the telescope, but for the um, surrounding communities to make use of. 
So our human resource development, again, this reducing the skills gap, um, we issued over a thousand bursaries through our first 10 years of our human uh, resource development program. And uh, these were in the areas of STEM, so not just astronomy bursaries, but engineering and sciences. And I think nearly 150 of those have gone to our partner countries in Africa. Technology development and innovation is very important. As I say, it's, it's almost been a requirement. So for Meerkat's Imager, for example, and storage, we um, couldn't afford off-the-shelf technologies. It would have been far too expensive for our budget. So we developed actually the most efficient uh, supercomputer of its kind in Africa. And we did so for 30% of the price of off-the-shelf computing. So some of our uh, technology development has been budget driven and some of it has been uh, technology requirement driven where something is not available to solve our technology problems. So we developed uh, in partnership originally, we developed the Roach boards. This was with the Casper group and then we developed Scarab. So this is um, utilizing FPGA uh, hardware. Uh, technology and um, it allows for faster computing and uh, it's more robust and requires less uh, cooling etc. We developed uh, the Iron Hive technology so this is a supercomputer uh, sealed in hermetically sealed in uh, mineral oil and this vastly reduces the cooling requirements on the computer uh, this reduces the need for a big data center to house all the machinery required to cool um, computers and why this is important is it can be deployed in remote areas with very little infrastructure and this has big impact in Africa. Uh, our low cost data storage solutions uh, are utilized on Meerkat and also use useful in conjunction with IronHive uh, for remote uh, data facilities. And Comrade, Comrade is a passive radar solution for aircraft traffic. Um, we did this on site because we can't use a normal radar and we need to detect the aircraft passing over our telescope obviously to remove them from our data and a lot of small aircraft may not have their transponders or not have them on so passive radar utilizes the digital tv signals etc floating around in the atmosphere reflect off the craft and allow us to uh, detect them but this system has uh, defense applications um, for uh, use, say, for um, anti-trafficking um, in Africa, border control. It also adds information to the larger system of air traffic uh, control across Africa, which is um, lim very limited in some areas. So this is just to show you that some of the technologies developed for uh, radio astronomy, which is just pure science, have had very big impacts um, in normal everyday life. Um, for I had to figure out in my modeling um, how the expenditure was on Meerkat um, was directed in terms of socioeconomic benefit. So just a breakdown for you, um, CAT7 cost roughly 600 million Rand and the Meerkat telescope cost about 2.7 billion. That's all the infrastructure requirements and the actual telescope hardware and software. Um, these figures were as of two years ago, but we spent almost, I think probably it's closer to 500 million now, but at the time was about 350 million on human capital development. Um, contributions to the design of SKA and the design of new technologies in SKA was 160 million Rand. Uh, purchasing of land from farmers, and distributing those funds. Um, the AVN uh, expenditure uh, at that time mainly towards the refurbishment of the Ghana tennis telescope and this did, doesn't include any cost towards the actual SKA project. So when we break it down like this it's important to look at these breakdowns because it shows of a project of at the time about four billion rand it shows that 2.7 billion was actually spent on the science the 1.3 billion was actually spent on um, training, education, infrastructure, etc. outside of the project. 
and that's a very good proportion for a sustainable science program. So my day job, I am the Africa program manager. Essentially, we have the AVN program, which is our eight partner countries in Africa and establishing radio astronomy infrastructure and capacity in those countries. But there are many programs like DARA um, that are contributing enormously to this process. And so we wanna make sure that all of these uh, programs are tied together, complementing one another and not going on tangents or duplicating expenditures and efforts as there are a lot of smaller programs developing now. So part of my job is to tie that together and then to find the funding and sustainability models for the actual radio astronomy investment in these countries. So originally the AVN aimed to develop VLBI capacity across uh, Africa. So if you look at all the VLBI networks, and I'm assuming you know what VLBI is, it's very long baseline interferometry. In my simple mind, it's essentially just uh, the further, the, the longer the baseline between dishes, the better resolution you're going to get in space. But um, VLBI networks exist around the globe, but there's a gap in Africa. And so the hope was to develop this network in pre preparation for uh, SKA phase two, which would host remote uh, SKA arrays of telescopes in Africa. Uh, we've had challenges in developing, in uh, pursuing the AVN program challenges in terms of resourcing, and that is funding skills, et cetera, and resourcing um, from the side of our partner countries as well as in South Africa. So we've broken down the program a little, and some of the countries are looking to refurbish old telecoms dishes to use as VLBI. Some countries are looking to host new, brand new dishes, which may even in the, uh, end up being SKA dishes. And the real challenge we face though, is if I had to deliver a brand new dish to each of these countries right now, would they be able to, um, would they be able to utilize the dish uh, for their benefit, for science, et cetera? So it's really, hot, it's really important on the road to developing this infrastructure to develop the skills required to develop the scientists and when I say skills, skills to do the science and skills to operate and maintain the dishes. Um, no country wants to have this wonderful infrastructure and their own science, they don't even have scientists that can utilize it. So education is a big part of AVN. And now we're looking to deliver uh, training telescopes and build the capacity around these dishes so that it becomes a, it becomes a sustainable scientific growth area for each country. Um, so in my role, um, to address some of these challenges, we've been looking at co-locating other science instrumentation and satellite receiving ground stations um, on these sites. So we have sites that have electricity and fiber and security, essentially. And on these sites, we will have radio astronomy infrastructure. If we co-locate satellite ground stations on these sites, we now are able to ge generate revenue for these uh, sites, skill sharing. And this allows for um, self-sustainable sites. So the partner countries won't then have to look for the funding to be able to maintain these sites. And we can have more than one ground station, each of which generates in revenue. They also generate the ability for these countries to receive a much lower cost and in real time satellite data that they can utilize for their own situational awareness and solving problems in each of those countries. Other science instruments can also be uh, co-located on these sites and this will grow employment, uh, innovation and allows for a site where government, academia and industry can all participate. And so we hope to develop these and as these sites grow, they will hopefully become hubs of development and innovation and start generating their own value adds uh, to the marketplace and to these countries. So something uh, I wanted to point out that we struggle with, um, I founded Women in Aerospace Africa and what's really important is perception and um, 
uh, attracting the many bright women that we have in Africa into um, scientific uh, roles. And I wanted to point out here, this woman at the top was a beautiful model and actress, um, but she was also a mathematician who developed uh, frequency hopping, which is utilized today in uh, wireless technology. And these five party girls looking here like a night out, they're actually all astronauts. So um, to you students, to the female students who need to um, stay inspired and to inspire other young women and the men who need to change their attitudes and start incorporating women into the sciences and technology and space sectors. Um, I think it's important to remember that these are perceptions that women can't do these jobs. And um, I challenge you all to help and break, break these molds. So this is how we see a woman's world. And this is how we see a man's world. Yet this uh, superbike racer who won uh, this EVA astronaut and this fighter pilot, these are all women um, who've been firsts in their uh, fields. And so there is no man's world or woman's world. Uh, these are perceptions that um, the young growing students of today need to change as we move forward. Oops, backwards. Okay, so just to give you some exciting stuff that's going on. So I also founded the Foundation for Space Development. We're just a little foundation, and these are my partners. And we each have a passion project in space. Um, mine is Africa to Moon, which I'll discuss. Adriana is to get to Mars. And uh, Kuto is developing a cheap and easily distributed solution for data distribution in disasters in Africa. And uh, Guido on the right is very passionate about STEM and innovation. And so he drives programs in that area. Uh, Adriana's program Off World is very exciting because this is looking at the human aspects and the technology aspects to survive in space, which means um, testing technologies and people to their limits and becoming the foremost experts of surviving in extreme environments. So the benefit to this is uh, these solutions can be utilized in space travel, but also the solutions can be used on Earth to solve problems. For example, uh, you know, um, water recycling and solar power and the various things they're working on actually can be used to solve problems on Earth. And so they will be spending a, a year in Antarctica over the winter testing technologies and people in a very difficult environment. Uh, the next year they will be doing the same in a desert environment. And then for the third year, they'll be training in an underwater environment. So it's gonna be rigorous, but um, we hope she'll be prepped for Mars by the end of it. My baby and my pet project is Africa to Moon. So the idea here is to build a really robust, low cost, uh, radio telescope for the far side of the moon. Um, on Earth, you can't really detect uh, under 10 megahertz because the ionosphere reflects these away from Earth, but that's not the case on, on the moon. So we hope to do first time science in under 10 megahertz. And to do this, we've designed um, what we call moon balls or Carla's balls. <laughs> and these are essentially self-inflating balls. We will deliver 54 of them to the far side of the moon. Each represents a country in Africa and they will hopefully fall randomly and with enough space between them that together they will act as a radio telescope. We will then transmit uh, the uh, data to a small satellite that will be orbiting the moon and then relay that back to earth to do science on, uh, on the ground here, but also to inspire. Um, so far, this project has been driven by people's uh, contributions of their time and effort. And we want to show that, you know, Africa can get to the moon and we can do it by collaboration. We don't need a big check. So we've already had a launch offered to us at no cost if we're ready. Um, but the requirement is for, to demonstrate that these balls can survive 
in space and that they do work and operate. So we hope that next year, sorry, it says late 2020, but COVID's changed that. So we do hope that next year we will be testing um, the balls on the International Space Station, or rather outside of it, hopefully in partnership with NanoRex. And um, if the balls work, we would look at within four years uh, deploying uh, this telescope on the far side of the moon. So um, hopefully it's not too high in the sky. And if you'd like to participate, feel free to let me know. And that's all I have. I hope you found that interesting and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks very much, uh, Carla. It was an uh, extremely interesting range of uh, topics, uh, everything from space astronomy and, and economics, which is clearly your, your, your passion. Um, so ma many thanks for that. Um, we've already got uh, quite a few questions in the bag. Uh, just let me, we'll just take some of these in, in order, I think. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll. Um, so the first one comes from uh, Solomon, uh, who's from Ghana. Um, Solomon's currently in the status of, again, being affected by the COVID. He's supposed to be starting a master's in uh, with us in Leeds um, already, but We'll have to wait a little while longer before he can join us. Uh, he asked me to ask the question for him, so I'll just go ahead with that. So um, he's asking what models you're using in your PhD to find how technology and space science uh, drives development and, and what are the kind of key parameters in those models? So um, originally I was using standard economic growth models, solo, etc. These are just normal growth models. You can uh, look them up online, but I realize they're not providing me with what they need, what I need. They're too generic. And although they're very applicable to developed nations, they're not very useful for developing nations, not what I'm trying to do. And I mentioned some of the parameters that they tend to use in these models, like um, uh, knowledge economy, etc. cetera. Um, I've realized that I need to, develop my own model um, a version of these models um, but not the same and I need to use my own parameters and so some of the parameters I've, I've adjusted for example um, instead of macroeconomic stability I use uh, political suitability um, the reason for this is when you're talking about space and science projects they're highly expensive projects they you know it's a big decision to make and you might find that a political regime may or may not be acceptable, uh, considered a di dictatorship, etc., which may seem as uh, unstable in a normal model, but actually it's a very stabilizing factor towards technology growth because um, an example is China. They're very successful in science and space science. Their space program is um, robust. Uh, but one may not consider their uh, political regime as suitable or appropriate uh, as appropriate or depending on who, which viewpoint you're looking at. So I've started to look at, at parameters and modeling those parameters that are relevant specifically to African, the African situation, like access to resources is one of uh, my parameters. And that is access to resources, whether it be water, food, technology, education so um i also focus on technology adoption and absorption so you you can provide technologies to a country but based on their um legacy technology or their current technology status they may not be able to absorb this technology or utilize it so i'm looking at a number of different parameters and it's a long conversation which i'd be happy to have with you but i think Maybe we could pick that up outside of this. Uh, thanks, Carla. Um, I think your, uh, your mention of the Comrade system sparked quite a bit of interest amongst the audience, <laughs> uh, as you can imagine. Um, so there's a couple of questions on that. Uh, I'll, I'll, um, so both Patrick and Emmanuel uh, are proven asked that question. I'll, I'll let Proven ask this one because he's got a couple of others as well. So. 
Uh, I'll just unmute Proven. Uh, Proven, do you want to ask your first question about Comrade first? Because you asked about the context of Ghana, but um, Patrick asked about it in the context yeah. of Kenya as well. So maybe just... Yeah. So, um, uh, hello, Kala. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, so... Um, I'm still there, Proven. We've lost your audio for the moment. So I could ask the answer the typed question so long if you want. You said yeah, well, um, Proven. Can you ask yes, the first question? Yes. Yeah, we lost your yeah, audio. I'm back. For yeah, I'm back now. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I wanted to know whether the Comrade system can be a serious consideration for co-location projects, like for us in Ghana. And then also, what is like, what is the economic benefits like? Is it something that you think that it is quite beneficial to pursue, or it may just be a contribution to <clears throat> um, other other sectors of the economy? For instance, the for the defense application of it as well. Then. Uh, well, so that's the second question. There, uh, proven, and, and yeah. we'll just talk about the comrade thing first. Okay, so yes, we are looking at comrade in Ghana and all of our sites uh, to co locate it there. Um, co locating its data facility would be at the site, and then of course the actual instruments for comrade would be placed at either hotspot areas on the border um, or near the uh, near airports. Uh, the benefit is, um, as you point out, there is benefit, but it's almost a benefit in saving. So if you reduce trafficking, um, if you reduce illegal fishing, uh, you're saving your economy money. So I don't think that um, the, the application necessarily derives direct revenue, but it reduces losses. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, Patrick, you've got your hand up as well. I'll just allow you to talk. Maybe you wanted to follow that up, maybe in the Kenyan context. Uh, I want you to elaborate on how the technology can be used in Kenya to achieve border control and anti-trafficking and coaching, and how they can be linked to mobile phones to achieve this objective. And if you caught that, Carla? Um... Uh, can you can you repeat that for me? Didn't hear it all. I think you're you're a bit too close to the microphone, Patrick. Maybe. So, are you ready? Elaborate on how common technology can be used in Kenya to achieve border control and anti-trafficking and poaching, and how they can be linked to mobile phones to achieve this objective. That's my question. Okay. It's, it's so, typed, uh, um, Carla, a bit further down on the list of questions. Okay, so... Um, okay, so if we used uh, Comrade, for example, in Ghana, the idea would be to tie in that data with satellite data or data even received, you know, using cell phones. For the most uh, real-time effective use of it, the data would be combined. Um, so if you use Comrade in Kenya, you have a new satellite that's been launched. And so utilizing your um, remote sensing data, tying it in, uh, definitely it could be used to complement border control, anti-trafficking and reduction of illegal activities. Um, and any number of these uh, satellite uh, data provisions and solutions can be offered through mobile phones. Um, so, and that is where the revenue lies. So for example, you have a, uh, a farmer can use an app on his phone and that'll notify him if a part of his farm, uh, a plant is dying, for example, needs more water, whatever it may be. And that can happen through the mobile phone and that application is where the the revenue is generated. I hope that answers what you're asking. 
Yeah, thanks, Ricardo. And um, just I'll just chip in there myself. Then you know that kind of delivery of space solutions to mobile phones is also the subject of uh, another big uh, overseas aid project run out of Leeds, the the African Swift project, which is all about real time weather forecasting. Uh, so you know it's a lot of uh, uh, climatologists and meteorologists uh, at Leeds and other other UK institutions partnering with. Uh, Ghana and Kenya are some of the countries and um, you know so they can deliver uh, real you know much better real-time weather forecasts to fishermen to work out whether they can put to sea or not and and to farmers to to make real-time decisions uh, as well um, yeah. so that's yeah so that's you know this is really excellent examples of how uh, the same sort of technology in radio astronomy and, and satellite communications can all be put to good use especially if we link it to, you know, uh, big computing and AI solutions as well. So, um, Proven, do you want to ask your, your next question? Uh, I think you're, you can still talk. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, um, Kala, you made mention that, um, I think in the beginning, that it's somehow difficult to measure realistically the contribution of space or space science in Africa. Um, throughout your work, maybe for the past few years, uh, is there a realistic way we can actually do this? Or is there a realistic way we can convince our ordinary people on the street? Because when they see you, they say, what are you doing? Telescopes, space, but that's not important. We have more pressing needs. Um, how best do we measure the contribution of uh, space technology in Africa? Yeah, as soon as I finish my thesis, I'll be able to tell you. <laughs> no, um, I think the best is uh, what we do currently is derive um, our own examples from others. So okay. India, India is a great example. If you look, India has managed to commit with many challenges similar to those of Africa. They committed a huge amount to build a space program. But what was interesting about this space program is it had to reach benefit down to grassroots level. And so their space program has solved a number of rural issues and people have access to that program really at the most rural level, whether it's telemedicine or teleeducation, et cetera. And so when you, if you look at their example for, as an example, it is um, very well documented. So you can take the numbers and apply those to your country and you know we're relevant and you can almost der derive a, a model of what you think the benefit would be in your country using them as an example but currently that's what we have to do you can use south africa as well there is the problem is a lack of data reliable data um over a long term which is why we're finding it hard to model these countries okay yeah thank you Okay. Yep. Thanks. Um, Proven, I think we'll keep your last question back at the end because uh, aliens is always a good topic to finish on. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> might, spark, might spark a massive debate. Um, so, and I want to get, we've got quite a few questions in now, so I'll try and get as many people in as possible. If that's okay, we'll come we'll back to you. Um, so uh, next up is uh, Dennis, who has a very pertinent question because, you know, Carla has a very inspiring talk there about, about the vision and, you know, the start of it is is all about uh, realizing the uh, AVN program. So, um, Dennis, do you want to? I've unmuted you or allowed you to talk. Do you want to? Okay, can you hear you both again? Yep, we can hear. You. Okay, thank you very much, Carla, for the wonderful talk. My question relies on realizing the AVN vision. So now it appears that I don't know the challenges that you mentioned um, with the partner countries, how committed are they to realizing this dream? And if they're not very committed, do we have a plan B to make sure the vision becomes a reality? Thank you very much. Um, so our partner countries, they are committed. Um, they don't all have a lot to commit uh, if you understand what I mean. Um, they're enthusiastic and they're supportive, but not all of them have the appropriate resources to commit. Um, 
And the plan B we've been working on with our partner countries um, is that not all of them necessarily need to have uh, full VLBI uh, capacity and not necessarily right from the beginning. So we are looking up at setting, uh, establishing a training telescope program. So where each of the countries will have training interferometers and to ultimately develop a training VLBI network and uh, delivering these solutions like I've discussed with you where we can um, either have a dual use dish or co-located dishes that can generate revenue as well as do science while we're growing this capacity in each of the countries. Um, we've reassessed from the original AVN program, we've sat down with each of the countries and had honest conversations about what they can do and what they can't do and what they hope to achieve. So we're trying to be more uh, specific about the program we're designing for each of the countries to ultimately get to the AVN, but in a way that matters to those countries and answers the challenges of that particular country, as opposed to a cut and paste uh, one fits all. Right, Dennis, uh, does that answer your question? Um, did you want to follow up? No? Okay. Thanks uh, very much, Carla. Um, so next up we have uh, Sarah from the Ghana Planetarium. Let me just uh, allow you to talk. Okay. Sarah, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Or the first of your questions, and then we'll take the second one. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, my question was about the, I was really interested in the, uh, what you talked about, the locally developed supercomputers and all those innovations. I thought that sounded amazing. And so I just wondered, uh, is that being, you know, developed, being rolled out anywhere else? Is it kind of commercially available? Because it just seems to make so much sense if you can cut the costs of those um, supercomputers super and the way they're housed. That just sounds uh, amazing. So I wondered what was the progress on rolling those out to anywhere else in either in South Africa or other countries? Um, so uh, the Scarab, the FPGA board has a lot of other application and has been utilized in many areas. Um, the others, for example, the computers, uh, the supercomputer, not yet. Uh, we only recently perfected it. Uh, we, I do hope that we will be sharing these in each of our partner country sites as a hub, you know, of technologies. But we are eager to roll them out. I think we, our teams are very focused on uh, Meerkat, uh, you know, getting it built and then getting the SKA built. So um, the focus or isn't always on the marketing, <laughs> but yes, uh, these can be rolled out to whoever needs them or is prepared to contribute towards their manufacture. Okay, thank you. Do you want to go ahead and ask your second question, Sarah? Oh, okay, yes. So the Africa to Moon project, um, <laughs> you said there was, which I think sounds amazing, uh, <laughs> there was a, a moon ball, 54 moon balls, one for each country, so I wondered how can we get involved? You said we should tell you if we want to get involved. And then is the idea that each country will somehow have access to one of the moon balls? Is that why there's the 54? Yeah, we want to, well, first of all, the 54 was to have representation, but now we hope that when the design is complete, that we could have a team in each of those countries, whether it's a university or whatever, um, that builds their ball. You know, and then uh, if each country that wants to can build their own ball, put their own flag on it, etc. And we had also thought of each of those countries could actually put a micro little chip in with um, almost a time capsule, you know, of the university or of the country as well that can go up there with it. So um, there's a number of ways to get involved. Um, if, you, if you're seriously interested, then I can add you to our next team meeting. Okay, great. Well, uh, yeah, adding a little time capsule for each country would be a great <laughs> outreach type of project for 
Well, yeah, the idea is if we pull that off and they get to the moon, then the next challenge will be for Africa to collaborate to go fetch the capsules. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to be like all these terrible Western countries and polluting everything everywhere. No, no, we have to go fetch our balls. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up after it. Okay, great. Um, next up, um, and again, good to see uh, so many women asking questions, uh, getting inspired by uh, you already, Carla. So Joyce is next up. Uh, so let me allow you to talk, Joyce. Okay, Joyce, do you, you've, again, you've got two questions. So do you want to ask your first question, please, Joyce? Okay. So my first question uh, was that, uh, Carla, you said something about, oh, no, okay, that's the second one. The first one is that you are building capacities, but what I've realized is that most of the capacities is in sciences. But then your presentation made us understand that every country is supposed to be able to operate their own uh, infrastructure. So if scientists are the only ones that are being developed, then it will be difficult for we to man our own telescope. If you don't have structural engineers, if you don't have mechanical engineers, RF, come and etc. So my question is, are there any plans of building capacities in engineering? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so in South Africa, our, our bursaries and our training programs have been obviously mostly focused on science, but also on engineering. But um, it hasn't been a focus in Africa. And on all of the universities we met with now in terms of implementing training telescopes and et cetera in our partner countries, we've recommended that they develop um, a partner program between the faculties so that we don't implement a telescope with the physics faculty, but that the engineering faculty and their students are responsible for the projects around implementing, developing the infrastructure, et cetera, power, whatever. And then uh, the science, uh, the data computer science uh, department will contribute uh, to developing the requirements around that with uh, the telescope and by doing this we can develop masters challenges and uh, topics and get the other def uh, departments involved absolutely because there's no point in having a telescope and a scientist and someone who doesn't know how to fix it or run it so you are correct and we're trying in our way to grow uh, more involvement with engineering in our partner countries, but it is something that has to be looked at. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I'm sure as we've talked about before, Joyce, and it's, you know, it's, we're very much aware of that in DARA, then DARA was obviously focused on the radio astronomy aspects, uh, not so much on the engineering side, um, because it was <laughs> dreamt up by me, who's not an engineer. Uh, and, um, <laughs> Yeah, but we're very conscious of it, and um, you know, if if uh, great floods of new money come forward, then you know we've certainly planted the idea of you know more of a of an of an engineering site sort of parallel project to run alongside the radio astronomy as well. But you know, we don't. And we do. de <laughs> we definitely need engineers to get to the moon. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Joyce, do you, do you want to ask your second question? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Carla, you said 150 badges have been handed out to partner countries out of the 1,000, which, which is practically just about 15% to the eight partner countries. I think that is not enough. Uh, other than that, we would have a lot of human capacity in South Africa, but then barely few in the other countries, which will make the ABN project, uh, uh, what do you call it? Absolute because then the other partner countries wouldn't have the capacity to absorb man their infrastructure. So are there any future plans of increasing capacity in other developed country other developing countries, the partner countries? Because uh, at least Dara is trying to do that, but what about South Africa? Is there any hope of they extending more of their budgets to the other eight partner countries? So I think on the education side, I mean, I'm not the best person place to answer this and probably uh, Melvin is better placed than me, but I think the hope is to create more capacity in our partner countries. Um, the only source doesn't have to be our bursaries at SKA. Uh, we had to, one of our mandates was to build a pipeline of scientists within South Africa because 
uh, the SK is hosted there. So we've done that. Um, and we have as well in Africa. So there's two ch challenges with our partner countries is um, we can train, we're training these people in radio astronomy, but there aren't dishes yet. There aren't organizations to employ these people. And we're having this challenge where people are being trained, but then there's no one to employ them. And so they're moving overseas to continue their studies further. They're being snapped up by other organizations. And so of the 150 trained, they're not actually performing those functions within their countries at the moment. So the challenge is, just, is not just about increasing the number of bursaries, but it's increasing the opportunities that once these people have been trained, that they have somewhere to go and work and give value back in their country. So it's a larger project, it's a larger problem of growing this area than just offering more bursaries. It's actually developing the places for these poor students to work once they qualify and offering programs that are attractive so that they're not being attracted by programs um, overseas and they're not coming home. Yeah, I think there's a, a nice synergistic uh, thing going on with the, you know, the code education type program that, that Carla's talking about and, and you know, getting, the, getting some kind of dishes on the ground. People are gonna be more, you know, with the DARA training, they're going to be much more likely to return home if there are some kind of facility to use and, and perhaps, you know, an opportunity to actually also develop businesses solutions on the side as well uh, to make it all sustainable. Um, so I think you know, that's, we really have to link those two together uh, very nicely. Okay, thanks for that. Um, uh, next up, uh, uh, Samson uh, from Kenya, I think, uh, has a couple of questions. So let me let me allow you to talk, Samson. Uh, okay, Samson, do you want to go ahead and ask the first of your question? Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Carla, for such an inspiration. Uh, I have two questions. The first one, one was regarding the mission about Comrade. That Comrade can be used to do good on the you also mentioned about real-time monitoring. So my concern is to know how soon will the information be received when you say real-time, after how many minutes. Uh, the other one is uh, the, the solutions that you have mentioned, the resolution that you have mentioned, they, they are very effective. They, they, they will, out of doubt, foster economic growth. But do you think, for example, like Kenya, are we ready in terms of equipment-wise, and political stability to adopt and absorb these solutions. Thank you. Did you catch those, uh, Carla? Okay, so, um, so in terms of um, data from Comrade, it's looking real time. Um, so yes, it's real time information. And when you combine it with satellite information, it, al it then allows you to update information that wasn't real time, which almost gives you a real time, inf you know, larger information set. So I think that answers that question. Um, Kenya, uh, Kenya is, <laughs> I can't say if Kenya is ready or not ready, but um, I think you have an institutional organization, you have a space agency, you have the, your national facility that where the SKA sits, um, which is very supportive and proactive. You have your um, universities that are very proactive. So I do think um, Kenya is ready for technology growth. Um, but what's always important is that you have to decide what problems you're trying to address in the country towards economic growth. You know, are you trying to reduce sort of theft as in illegal fishing or mining, or are you trying to address more efficient farming? You have to decide on what areas you want to target challenges in your country. And then by using the appropriate technologies, whether it would be comrade or satellite technology or whatever it may be, you then invest in growing those technologies to solve those problems. Uh, technology in 
a generic sense cannot just be cut and paste into a country. So Kenya is ready. Um, the challenge we all have is selling, like you mentioned politically, it's, it is ready, but you have to sell it to government. They have to be able to justify spending money on this versus that. So, which is why it's very important to show government that you're using these technologies to solve problems. And once they invest, then yes, of course, that technology can then be utilized to improve the economy. Yeah, and I think you know, another key important factor here is not imposing solutions from the outside that you know, other countries think that your country needs. It's, it's um, you know, yourselves thinking up the problems and the solutions and taking them up to the government level for investment and, and, or just you know, getting private financial investment. Uh, and so obviously we're trying to encourage that within the DARA project, both through our sort of group development projects that we've been sort of funding at a little seed corn level uh, and also, you know, getting S Steve Jones to give advice to people who have individual ideas about, um, you know, business ideas in the space sector. So, um, you know, so that bottom-up approach as well as the top-down approach is extremely important. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Samson, for those uh, questions. Um, next up, uh, Albert. Um, thinking like a radio astronomer and worried about RFI. Uh, so, Albert, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Carla. Uh, my question uh, got to do with um, RFI. Since most um, uh, challenge for astronomers is the RFI, uh, was there any model to show so far that this collocation project will not be another challenge to uh, astronomers? Since some of these uh, stations are going to be at the same uh, uh, station. Um, I have a second question. Can I follow up with that? Can I ask as well? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, the second one is, is there any uh, discussion or arrangement with these partner countries to contribute at least uh, a percentage or two of their uh, scholarship, annual scholarship programs uh, to this training so that uh, the intake from each country will increase? Um, unlike maybe we see each student from each partner country every year. But if uh, this discussion is in place, I think uh, it will increase maybe that number to two or three or five each year so that uh, the realization of this uh, AVN project will be achieved within the shortest possible time. If there is not, then I suggest to Sarau and Dara to discuss with the partner countries of how they can contribute to this uh, scholarship uh, scheme. Thank you. Um, so on the scholarship scheme, that's a very good idea, actually. Uh, um, I think that's worth looking at. Um, uh, in terms of the RFI, so we obviously have to be careful not to interfere. I've been trained in RFI <laughs> avoidance since uh, after seven years at Sarea. Um, the satellite dishes, uh, the satellite ground station will be receiving um, in different frequencies and will only transmit if the um, dish is not operational. So a strict um, policy of the agreement, a st strict part of the whole agreement is that the dish, uh, the receiving station cannot interfere with the radio astronomy dish. Um, the only thing we're waiting on is the RFI report on the actual dish, ground station dish, uh, its operations, you know, when it's switched on that its actual uh, internal technologies are not creating RFI. But it's one of the guiding principles of the agreement. Um, our guys won't let it switch on if it's going to interfere. Do you have the power to shut it down if it does start interfering? Yeah, yeah it's stated in the MOU, AMOA. Yeah, that's really good. Um, Albert, just to clarify your question about scholarships, perhaps, did you mean that, you know, each of the individual AVN partner countries, each of their governments do fund scholarships, you know, for PhDs and that kind of thing? And you're, you were asking if, you know, Graeo and 
well, South Africa and the UK could lobby them governments to join in and, and ring fence some of those scholarships for radio astronomy? Is that what you meant? Yes, um, in her earlier submission, she said all the partner AVN partner countries are, um, they are fully supportive of this particular project. So I know of um, some of these countries, each year they have a scholarship or the government has a scholarship uh, uh, budget, which they sponsor students for various programs. So if um, they can also contribute a percentage to this uh, training in the astronomy or radio astronomy, if uh, one or two students, in addition to what Dara and Sarawd is um, having already, uh, that is what I'm, I am proposing or suggesting. Yeah, no, that, that is worth investigating. Yeah, I mean, we need to uh, do a bit of investigation on that. But I think, you know, especially perhaps more on the co-location side, it might, the governments might listen a bit more in a sense of getting, getting more uh, effort into the sort of associated ground station science might, might be a, an easier way to persuade them to, to fund the scholarships whilst Dara and Sereo continue to take care of the radio astronomy side. Perhaps might, might, might be a good way to attack that, but I, I'm just thinking out loud here. So m many thanks for that, Albert. That was a very, very good suggestion. Um, okay, so we've just got a, a few more left. Carlo, you happy to continue for a little yeah. while? Yeah. Um, so a senior has a quite a pertinent question, I think. Let me... Senior, do you want to ask your question? Just unmute. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. I, I just want to know if you know any entity or company in Africa that's in the satellite imagery business, like using uh, satellite data for maybe optimization of agriculture, mining, etc. Thank yeah. you. So I think especially examples of perhaps new startups that have, are in this field perhaps. Yes, so, yes, precisely. Yeah. So um, there are a number of uh, companies in South Africa that I'm aware of um, and there are a few Small ones in Africa, um, I would have to look up again who and where, but there are. And there are also a number of European, obviously, and US companies uh, offering the similar in Africa. And the problem is we, we're challenged by, although companies are starting up and utilizing data, they're having to utilize data from American and European satellites. So um, ideally in the future, we would be able to access our own satellites. Um, but I think the, the biggest number of startups in this area are probably happening in South Africa. Um, but I would have to look that up and send you more detail. I can also put you in touch with someone, a dear vault who knows much more about this than I do. And he can probably give you even who's um, operating in your area. Yeah. Very good. Um, yeah, certainly, you know, a good thing about these e-seminars is to build contacts, build networks and put people in touch with each other. So uh, please don't be shy to, to follow up um, and, and, and make some more connections. So uh, thanks, Senior, for that uh, question. Uh, and, you know, that's those kind of space startup companies are very much the kind of thing that you know, if any of the DARA trainees have got ideas along those lines, then uh, trying to develop them, you know, working with people like Carla and DeVault, but also, you know, getting advice from, from Steve Jones, the DARA business manager, um, would be, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing we want to encourage. Um, I think we'll, we'll take a question from Paul uh, next. Uh, so who's also studying in Mauritius at the moment, but uh, originally from Kenya, has a question on the technology side. Go ahead, Paul. Hi, Carla. Hi, Carla. Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I'm interested in uh, one of the technologies uh, developed by the SK, and I'm just wondering if there are any 
uh, groups or working groups on the technologies that students like I can benefit from, or if there are any other links you can share with uh, us on the workings of these technologies and anywhere you can find details, more details on, on this technology. So like the Scarab, right? Mm. Yes, like the Scarab, the Snap, etc. Okay, so I am, um, so Scarab, for example, uh, the related work, working group is the KESPA collaboration. And so they're online. I mean, they, they're around the world, made up of people all over the world, and they run workshops and training programs. So you can definitely get involved with them. And I can put you in touch with the guys who lead that from our side in South Africa. And we don't necessarily have working groups on all the technologies being developed, but there's definitely always room for people to become involved, particularly students um, involved in radio astronomy. So I would ha be happy to put you in touch with each of the relevant people if uh, you guys let me know which technology you're interested in. Um, I could also put you in touch with Poncho and she runs our commercialization program, but a lot of these partnerships um, are not just for commercialization, but she can involve students in, you know, development and etc. I think, are you already in touch with Casper, Paul? I, I thought you were. In, not directly. Um, just, uh, I've just been looking at one of the, the boards that they manufacture, like the SNAP, but I, I'm not in contact with uh, uh, any of them in terms of uh, uh, more, more details on the workings of the board. So that is what I was thinking. Okay, well, great. Okay. Yeah, hopefully Carla can help put you in touch. Um, yeah, so Paul and Albert are building the uh, an array of three yeah. small bits in their Mauritius. Um, okay, thanks for that, uh, Paul. Um, Dennis has a, another question. There we go. There we go. Okay, Dennis, do you want to ask your question? Oh yeah, thank you very much. It's a follow-up over the AVN. I think so far only Ghana have had their telecom dish converted into a radio telescope, but we have like here in Zambia the Mumbai telecom dish. So I don't know in the nearest future we really seeing any of these or the telecom dishes being converted into radio telescopes. Thank you very much. Did you catch that, uh, Carla? So the, the, yeah. inevitable, the inevitable question, are there going to be more conversions of the, the uh, big telecom dishes? Well, I'm, a, I'm very happy to say I went to Zambia finally my first time uh, just before COVID. <laughs> and I got to vi uh, visit the big dish there. I must say I was really impressed as Zambia's level of readiness towards uh, SKA refurbishment and the various programs is really, really strong. Um, sadly, our next steps got waylaid by lack of travel, etc. cetera. But um, we're, we're just doing a study now to make sure that the, we're, we're developing an implementation plan with the Zambians to decide on whether or not um, a refurbishment is in fact the better option to a new new build. We, we're required to show that, you know, uh, do a cost benefit analysis. Um, and we have a, a number of steps we're looking towards um, developing with them. They've actually just set up a brand new beautiful ground station as well. Um, and we also went to the SKA site and looking at what we can do there in the interim. So I can't answer for you now yes or no, that dish will get refurbished, but I can tell you that we're eager to move forward with Zambia and that they have a lot, um, a lot of readiness and eagerness, and I think we can move pretty quickly. Yeah, no, I've also visited the site and was very impressed with the site actually, and yeah, it'd be really great to be able to develop it. So yeah. You just mentioned there's a new dish there, or, or the new, a new ground station somewhere. Is it on that site or somewhere else? No. No, they built a ground station. Uh, I don't know Zambia very well, but it's, um, it's on the way to the SKA site, a little out of town. And it, um, it's an amazing little facility that's been built there, all brand new. 
Okay. So there's all, there's already an SKA site earmarked in Zambia. Okay. Well, a, the SKA phase two site, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got to visit the chief who had donated the that land to the project, and it was yeah very exciting. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay, totally good. Okay, well that's been a good run around. Um, I think we're we're ready for the final question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Proven. Do you want to uh, ask about aliens? I think you can unmute yourself again. Yeah. Okay, so yes, yeah, so um, Kala, you talked about the the SETI and the, the the breakthrough instrumentation. Um, I would be happy if you can just shed more light on that because it's a question that's <laughs> asking a whole lot of time. Are we doing a radio telescope to speak to aliens, or are we doing it to search for aliens? Or if now we have instrumentation that is trying to see if, uh, to hear if, if the aliens do speak. Uh, I will want to know more about this. Uh, okay, so Breakthrough Foundation, you can look them up online. Uh, they're based in America and they're very well funded. Um, and they are very eager to search for life. So they uh, part of the SETI search. <laughs> um, and so what they do is they have uh, partnerships with telescopes all around the world, um, like with Meerkat, where they put very expensive computing on the back end of the telescope and they sift through the data basically that we receive and they look for technology signatures. So essentially they're just looking for anything that's not natural. Um, that would be man-made or alien-made uh, in the data. So essentially we are listening to hear if there are any messages. Uh, I can tell you now we haven't uh, received any. <laughs> Currently there is no record of alien contact. Um, I think the real challenge is that we're listening in a frequency band and there are many frequency bands and we just don't have the technology to listen to all of them all of the time. And we, we're looking at radio signals, but maybe they uh, communicate in a different way on a different frequency. So um, it's very challenging to listen to just a little bit of space and hoping to get our answer, but we are listening. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can look up SETI, you can actually partner with SETI. Um, you allow your computers to be used for a certain amount of time and help them with their processing. Um, you can look at the various partnerships with Breakthrough. I mean, there's a lot of uh, support for clever ideas on how to listen. Um, but yeah, there's not really much more I can say. Or I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you saying aliens only talk to you, Carla. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because I come from there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I mean, SETI is an interesting thing. And, and, you know, I was involved when I was chairing the Cradle of Life Science Working Group for the SKA. And, you know, really for the first time, sort of SETI searches became part of the mainstream science case for the SKA. Um, rather than, you know, I mean, Breakthrough Listen is still this kind of privately funded venture. But, you know, we're happy to sort of make it part of the, the mainstream science case on um, on the SKA. Uh, well, at least I am. And we tried to persuade a lot of other people that it should. It was in the science book. Uh, and of course, it does excite an awful lot of people. You know, if you, uh, if you get kids coming along and you say that your telescope is searching for aliens, they suddenly get, <laughs> they suddenly get really interested. Um, yeah. And it is something, you know, just like at the moment on the on the Kutunze telescope, 32 meter in Ghana, then you have the Pulsar back end, which is basically just an extra computer, uh, you know, set up to, to monitor the radio signals in a particular way. You can, you know, if you can find people to, to bring SETI equipment, they can plug it into your telescope and you don't even know they're there. They just carry on searching their signals and you can still do your astronomy if you set it up right, which is what's happening at the SK as well. They keep yeah. searching for SETI signals, but at the same time, the telescope can be doing imaging or surveying or anything else. Uh, so it's a real another real advantage of radio astronomy that you can kind of 
use the signals uh, uh, you know, for different things at the same time. So you, you get more for your telescope uh, that way. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's really good. And um, yeah, so it's definitely something to think about. And obviously these, those kind of ventures are, are funded uh, potentially privately uh, and also good for outreach as well. So I think, great. I think we've uh, uh, exhausted the question there now. Um, and uh, many thanks, Carla, for, uh, for you know, putting in a big shift there and, uh, and answering all those excellent questions that we had uh, from around Africa. Uh, it's great to see, you know, the interest and the enthusiasm, you know, both on the, the astronomy side, the technology side, the economic side, the space side. Uh, this is, you know, these topics are the real heart of, of what DARA uh, is about. Uh, and, and as you know, it really links in very well now with, uh, with what uh, the Africa program is trying to do from the South African perspective as well. Um, so many thanks, Carla. Um, again, it's difficult for us to give you a round of applause because we don't want <laughs> unmute everybody. It would be chaos. Um, so on behalf of everyone, uh, let me, uh, you know. And for me, I'm Daniel for that. This is very high. So we're very excited to open the analysis unit. And we went off doing a lot of dialysis, but we got to a point whereby we could not even procure the consumables for the unit. And the only reason we were given that the, the consumables could not be procured was that there was no budget for that. So we even started sending patients away. So I'm sorry, Patrick, we're, you know, we're, we're not taking any more questions or comments here now. So, um, okay. Um, so let me, you know, let me just thank Carla. Uh, it's been a really good, really good session. Uh, if, if you want to contact Carla with follow-up questions, you know, you've, you've had her email uh, there at the end. Um, so I think that's it for me. I'll hand back over to Trish for a final wrap-up. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, Carla, for giving such a, an informative talk. And uh, I look forward to hearing if there are aliens out there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, with regards to feedback, I'll be sending a, a link to the feedback form out to everybody. So, so please do complete that as your feedback is really, really important to us. It's also an opportunity for you to uh, put forward your suggestions for future e-seminars. Uh, and because e-seminars uh, is still in high demand, uh, we'll continue to host approximately two a month and we'll continue to uh, offer these to former and current DARA, DARA Big Data and uh, Surreo uh, trainees. So what we've got planned coming up at the moment, we have uh, Professor Peter Wilkinson from the University of Manchester on the 8th of July. Uh, Peter's uh, going to be uh, giving an interesting talk about a little device that he's uh, developed called a Cantenna. Melvin, could you expand on that? A more technical term? <laughs> Not much. It's basically a, a radio <laughs> receiver that uses a tin can as the, as the collector. Um, so these are the going to be, you know, we're aiming. So Dara has been funding these little kits, so they will be distributing several of these uh, to each of the AVN partner countries. So, you know, a good kind of thing for an undergraduate university experiment uh, and probably for outreach as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and Peter's uh, e-seminar on the 8th of July will actually be the first part of a, a two-part uh, seminar. So uh, if you would like to join us, please go to our website and register for that. A couple of others that we, we've got planned but not quite scheduled in at the moment. We have one, uh, we have uh, Roger Dean from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, uh, hopefully giving a talk on the first image of the black hole. Uh, probably taking place around the end of July, start of August. We also have uh, Rod Hine from the University of Leeds. He's our antenna consultant working on the DARA project. I'll pass over to Melvin to give a little bit more detail about that. Uh, we haven't got a date again. It'll be around the end of July, hopefully, or maybe in August, Melvin? Yeah, so as well as sort of working on antennas, uh... Rod is also a keen sort of amateur radio person, runs an amateur radio club actually here in the town where I live. Um, and so he will be talking about sort of developing amateur radio clubs as a way of getting involved and getting, you know, 
good for outreach, good for school kids, getting people building little bits of kit. Uh, and also, you know, as a way of talking to people across the world uh, using radio technology. Excellent, super. So we, we do have quite a few things planned. Uh, we also have the YouTube channel where we'll be posting uh, these recordings. So please subscribe there. Uh, we also have social media announcements that we'll be making on Twitter and on our closed Facebook group. So it's always useful just to try and uh, subscribe to those. So you're, you're up to date with all of our announcements. That's everything from me. So nothing further to add. So I'll pass back to Melvin. Yep. Well, I don't think I have anything further to add either. Uh, so thanks for organizing again, Trish. Thanks for everyone for, uh, attending and, um, and, and sending in their questions. Again, for the smooth running of the program, then you know, please put the questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, and that allows us to, uh, you know, to manage the thing, manage the question session from our end. Okay, so thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>